Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to um, uh, Matthew's talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my, uh, my name is Elias Altanis. I'm uh, um, a member of AXA, uh, and I'm a senior lecturer at the, in the School of Electrical Engineering. Uh, so, part of uh, AXA's series uh, of seminars, today we were fortunate to have uh, Associate Professor, Professor Matthew Hall uh, from the ANU, uh, who's going to be talking to us about uh, fusion. So, um, we've probably, you've probably been uh, hearing about uh, fusion, all the promises of fusion. There's a lot of research. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we heard about the break even with the National Ignition Facility. I'm not sure what your take is on this, uh, um, how much closer that puts us. Uh, and now we've got the ITER project, which is uh, the International uh, Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, and the interesting question for those of you who are um, interested in space, which is a question that I'm interested in, is what is this, uh, um, if, if anything can be said about uh, its implication for space travel and uh, propulsion. So, uh, I mean, I've read somewhere that uh, uh, 10 milligrams of uh, fuel <coughs> can generate the equivalent energy of a barrel, or more than the equivalent energy of a, of a barrel of petrol. So, would be uh, an interesting thing for space travel. Uh, Matthew is, uh, as I said, is, a, uh, is an associate professor at the uh, ANU. His uh, research interests are in the field of uh, magnetohydrodynamics, fluid modeling, and wave analysis of industrial plasmas, fusion plasmas, and space plasmas. I'm not sure if that implies space. No, <laughs> it's not such a Well, space is, is in there. Uh, he is the, uh, the founding chair of the Australian ITER Forum, a research uh, network spanning over 180 scientists and engineers, engineers advocating Australia's participation or involvement in the ITER project. Uh, he's uh, um, got a number of achievements, and in 2010 he was uh, um, the Young Scientist of the Year of the Plasma Physics Commission of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. You've read his uh, biography, I'm not going to spend any longer. Over to you. So thank you both the Australian Centre for Space Engineering and Carl Lepp for creating this opportunity uh, to talk with you today. So what I'd like to talk about is the ear project and fusion power sort of spanning through from the early post-war period uh, in the UK with the zero energy toroidal, toroidal assembly through to today's leading edge experiment which is the joint European Taurus in the UK. Uh, and completing with the next step fusion experiment, which is this ETA project. Uh, ETA also means the way, the way in Latin, uh, coincidental. Uh, but I'll, I'll spend much of the talk talking about what that project is and our possibilities or what's happening in terms of Australian participation in that project. So fusion is the power of the process, is the power, the process that powers the sun and the stars. Uh, on Earth, if you could uh, make it work, it would provide essentially limitless fuel available all over the world, produce large-scale energy production, has no greenhouse gases, it's intrinsically safe, safe and has no long-lived radioactive waste. So it's an ideal panacea, if you like, for large-scale energy base load uh, provision. The challenge is that it's hard. It's hard to make this work uh, on Earth. Uh, the sun works because it is a huge gravitational confinement system. Uh, the sun actually doesn't use the DT cycle that we would, that would be exploited on Earth. The sun uses the proton-proton cycle, and it does this because it's extremely big and it uses quantum tunneling. So there's very little of this reaction that occurs because the particles are very hot. Uh, the reaction occurs largely through quantum tunneling. So on Earth, the idea would be to try and harness the combination of deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen, to form helium and an energetic neutron. The energy gain is about 450 to 1. <coughs> this is the easiest reaction, or energetically the easiest reaction, to initiate. Uh, hence, it was the first reaction to be discovered. It was co-discovered by an Australian, so Mike Oliphant, way back in 1932. We claim it was an Australian discovery, but it was really done in Cavendish laboratories in Cambridge. So, <laughs> you can draw, uh, we, we, we can claim the correlation of that nonetheless. It's good enough. It's good enough. It's close enough. <laughs> Uh, the energy release per reaction, like fission, is all of millions of times greater than that of coal. Uh, so per unit reaction, it produces 17.6 MeV, compared to fission, which is 200. But the energy per unit mass of fusion is, much, is about four times that of uranium, because uranium is much heavier. Uh, 
So the idea is to try and initiate those reactions. In a fusion reaction, this helium ion uh, is an ion, so it's positively charged and captured by the machine. But these neutrons have no charge. They fly straight through the vessel. They're captured by the wall, and they hit the wall. That's how you get the power out of the system. So the big idea is that it uses small amounts of resource for big energy, energy production. So the idea is that if you use the amount of this top, lithium in a laptop computer battery plus a deuterium and half bath of water, it will provide enough fusion power to last an average person for 30 years. If I look at the fuel, fuel uh, source, well, the fuel source is deuterium and tritium. Deuterium is very abundant. If I look at the visible matter in the universe, nearly all of it is hydrogen. And everything is quoted you know, relative to the abundance of hydrogen. So for every 6,000 hydrogen atoms, there's one deuterium. So this is extremely abundant. Uh, tritium has a half-life of 12 and a half years, so it basically doesn't exist in nature. To create it, you have to activate lithium uh, by neutron activation. So then the question is, how much lithium is there? If you look at the solar system, um, more broadly in the solar system, it's quite abundant. Uh, for every 1,000 or so hydrogen atoms, there's one lithium ion. And then you ask the question, well, OK, let's just do a back of the envelope calculation. How long would this energy supply uh, su support uh, civilization if you were to exploit it? Well, an old estimate, which is based on 2001, is the energy usage for the planet is about 13 and a half terawatts. It might be bigger than that. Maybe if it's all magnitude, it doesn't matter. But if you look at the estimated energy of Earth reserves, they're 6 by 10 to the 8 and 2 by 10 to the 11 years of DD. They're, they're in their astronomical figures. This is this is this is beyond well beyond civilization time civilization time scale. Uh, maybe a hundred years is beyond civilization time scale. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's certainly beyond the uh, a civilization time scale that can be envisaged. So the question is, how do I achieve this? If I have two positively charged particles, I need to overcome the electrostatic repulsion to get them close enough so that the strong nuclear force takes over and the particles fuse. So I can do this by different, part, by different approaches. I can use a linear accelerator. So ANSTO has a linear accelerator. The ANU has one, basically slamming particles into a, in, into a target. But I don't need a big accelerator can, I, to do that. I can do that in a small crystal device. In fact, I could do it on this table in a small experiment. But it doesn't translate to power. So I can generate neutrons by a small crystal experiment, which accelerates particles by 10 k, uh, 10,000 volts. That's enough. Uh, to get a small proportion, a small amount of fusion occurring, but it won't scale to fusion power. There is a variant of this, which is beam target or laser block fusion, which might, and for many years there, there is still an emeritus professor, Heinrich Kora at USW, some of, the, some of you may know of, uh, who worked on laser block fusion, and that is a potential, uh, it does offer some potential uh, for fusion, but it's on a much longer time scale than magnetic confinement. There's inertial compression, basically the idea being where you uh, fire a bunch of lasers down to a uniform target, you heat the target, and then you use either radiation pressure or direct drive to cause the target to collapse. And you, you reach the, the, you heat the fuel supply up to ignition temperatures. This is good if you want to continue a bomb program under a, a weapon test ban environment. It's not so great if you want to produce power. And the reason why is because you have to get all of these lasers shone down to a minuscule point, and the laser light has to be uniform and, compl and completely symmetric around the device, because this device, this implosion, is extremely prone to Rady Taylor type instabilities, density, in inhomogeneities. And so the point being is that if I want to explode that pellet, it requires very precise engineering to do it. Now, yes, you might be able to make this work. Does it translate to a a commercial, power, a commercial power plant, I don't know. I don't know that magnetic confinement does either. But that's even harder to do than to order magnetic confinement. Uh, the one thing that is worth saying about it is that it, its primary funding is not civilian. Its primary funding is for, for another reason altogether. There's catalytic processes whereby you use muon catal catalysis to lower the binding energy. I, I talked about quantum tunneling to try and enable the proton-proton reaction. You can do the same thing with muon catalysis, which does lower the, lower the, the potential barrier. But the problem is that these muons have an extremely short half-life. Uh, so in order to make this reaction, uh, I can't generate enough muons 
and for them to last for a long enough period of time in order to lower the binding energy. So that really leaves uh, confinement approaches, either gravitational, well we know that works, I just look up at the sky and I can see that working, uh, electric, which means I have a series of electro electrode meshes in which I bias the target and bias the outer mesh and I try and uh, use electric fields to uh, accelerate particles into a, a target. That works as a neutron source. It has, it's not clear at all whether that will scale to power. The one that is most effective, at least we believe, in terms of scaling to power is magnetic confinement. So the idea is, is that I need to, as I said, I need these particles to have very high energy. So if I look at their cross-section for collision, I don't know whether there's a pointer here. Um, in any event, this is the cross-section for collision, and I can see that it's sort of maximum for the DT of the light isotopes at around about 100 million degrees centigrade. So that's where the reaction cross-section peaks. That's where, it isn't, there's, that's where <coughs> I get as much fusion yield as possible out of it. I want the density to be as large as possible because that's proportional to the energy yield, and I want the energy confinement time to be as large as possible. What's the energy confinement time? Well, the energy confinement time is an insulation parameter. It's really how long it takes for something like this jug of water to cool down if I leave it open to the, to, to the external surroundings. I can fold this in and form a simple power balance equation that tells me the fusion power is greater than the heat loss, and it tells me that this triple product has to be greater than this number. And that these extreme conditions, matter exists in this plasma state. So what's a plasma? Well, if I look at the gas in this room, all of the electrons are bound to the ions. So if I apply a strong magnetic field, nothing will happen unless you have a pacemaker. If, however, I dissociate the electrons from the ions and apply a strong magnetic field, the electrons and ions will start gyrating around the field lines because they experience a J cross B force. <coughs> Nearly all of the visible universe is in this state, and what we're trying to harness uh, is uh, we're trying to harness this plasma state to produce fusion power. So I mentioned that if I have a strong guide field, the particles will gyrate around the field lines. This shows a cross-section in which you can see these part charged particles, the alphas, the deuterium, and the triton particles gyrating. The neutrons aren't confined by the field at all, they have no charge. They go straight through it and out to the walls. So if I had a cylinder like this, for example, what would happen is that I get good confinement this way, I have terrible confinement that way, the particle would just fall out the ends. So the very simplest thing you can do is turn it into a torus. And that's exactly what um, a, a tokamak is, which is if I, can, if I twist this device back into a torus, um, I can close the magnetic field lines and the particles will remain uh, gyrating around these field lines. The most successful magnetic confinement device is this tokamak, and it means that there is a large plasma current that I'll talk about in just a moment. So what is a tokamak? It's a, it's a vacuum, it's a royal vacuum vessel in which I put this plasma to be ionized. And I create a, a toroidal magnetic field by using this large shaping coil. So this, this big field coil has a current running around it, which drives a current to the toroidal a long way around the, the machine. I then have a solenoid, so that the solenoid has a winding current that's running this way around it. That produces a large field that goes through this iron yoke. And if I ramp that, I will get a current which is induced inside plasma. It's a secondary transform of a transformer, or a secondary winding of a transformer. That will produce its own toroidally, a toroidally confining field like this. And I, to, to that, I add shaping coils above and below that produce closed flux surfaces interior. So what I've constructed is I've constructed by a combination of external and internal currents, a magnetic bottle that's confined in the plasma. This doesn't work, unfortunately. It did on my laptop, but it's not working here. What I wanted to show was that if I look from the center of the machine to the edge, uh, there is a, a grab B drift. So the point being is if, let's go back up here for a second, since I can't get that picture to work, unfortunately. If I go from the center of this machine to the edge, the field is decaying as I go outwards. Uh, the field is decaying, and that means that the electrons and ions will exhibit this grad B drift. As the, ions, uh, as the ions rotate in one direction, uh, their curvature is greater, uh, their curvature is 
less on the inboard than on the outboard side, so they gyrate in one direction, the electrons gyrate in the other direction, and the consequence is that you end up with a charge separation, uh, a vertical charge separation above and below. And if you have charge separation above and below, your machine will disrupt. So the way to avoid that is by putting, uh, adding this toroid, uh, putting a, making the field, rather than make it perfectly symmetric in this direction, twist it. So the magnetic field now has poloidal twist. Unfortunately, I don't have this image which doesn't show me here, but this image shows it. So that rather than the field going in, perfect, um, in, in a perfect toroidal direction, it has this poloidal twist. And the consequence is that both the electrons and ions see the, in both sides, they average over the entire curvature effects, and they, you don't end up with this net charge separation. The field lies, lies in a flux surface. So in a perfect tokamak, one which is axially or symmetric in this direction, if I follow this field line, it will either bite its own tail, or if I follow it for enough, for enough path length, it will lie in one of these surfaces. So the field will always lie on one of these flux surfaces. And the point is, if the field is sufficiently strong, the electrons and ions will be down very tightly to this flux surface. So ideally what I want to have is I make this magnetic bottle where I have all of these fields, that I have field lines with line surfaces, and then I make the field really strong. Because by making the field really strong, I confine the particles very tightly to the flux surfaces and I maximize this insulation. The idea being of all of this is that I want to maximize the core pressure because I want to lift the temperature to ignition temperatures uh, and this creates a magnetic bottle uh, that will bottle the, the magnetic field or bottle the plasma for ignition. I need to lift it then to extreme temperatures. I need to lift it to 100 million degrees. How do I do that? Well, I use a combination of ohmic heating. So this central, uh, this current that's driven around the plasma has ohmic losses. Um, unfortunately, the the conductivity varies as temperature. So the higher the temperature, the less effective it's going to be in terms of heating. And this limits the temperature to around about 3 keV. I need to lift it to 10 keV. 10 keV is, a, is the maximum in terms of the cross-section. So to lift it to 10 keV, I then have to use auxiliary heating. And the auxiliary heating that I use is a combination of RF heating. So this is coupling wave power um, to the plasma. This coupling is quite complicated electrical engineering problem involving impedance matching and it's often the case that not that much of the power gets coupled. So <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is not, this is not trivial physics at all. Uh, and neutral beam injection. So if I try and put, if I try and, let's suppose I try and have an energetic particle and I want to put that energetic particle into the plasma. If I fire that energetic particle and the particle's charged, it'll just get deflected out of the plasma. The reason why is because there's a strong magnetic field there. In order to get it into the plasma, it has to be neutral. So what I do is I have an ion source here, as if you have up to a potential, potential gradient of grids. I accelerate the ion source, I put it through a neutralizer, I then have a neutral population coming in here, the neutral population undergoes this charge exchange reaction, and I get the energetic particle confined. This is literally billiard ball physics. If you played on a billiard ball and fired the white, uh, the, fired the white ball into the center, that's exactly what's happening. You're changing the energy is going from this, the white ball, to the, to the charged particle to the, particle, to the particle that's moving. You're changing the charge from this to that, but essentially it's billiard ball physics. The third approach, of course, is that you want the DT fusion uh, to, to ultimately self-heat the plasma, where much of this, uh, the alpha particles are self-confined and heating it. So here's the progress in toroidal magnetic confinement over a function of time as measured by that triple product and year and central iron temperature. So here you can see a bunch of different experiments going back from the 1970s up to the present day. The present day is this basically accessing this, this break-even regime. It's not quite the break-even regime. It's a bit below that. Um, that's currently, the performance record is 1997. That's almost 20 years ago. Why, is it, why haven't we pushed it beyond that? Primarily because the machine has been looking at other physics since then. Uh, we knew that it could do uh, Q of 1, but it wasn't going to generate any useful physics en route to a Q of 5 or a Q of 10 experiment. All it was going to do was generate a political headline. Uh, so we haven't focused on that since. But uh, the break-even regime we're basically at. The next experiment is this burning regime, 
where the power um, out, the, the heating power is greater than a factor, sorry, the power out is a factor of five bigger than the heating power. And what it means is Y5, it basically means that this heating, this auxiliary, this, of, this alpha particle heating is equal to the auxiliary heating. So this is now a plasma in which half of the heating is coming from the alpha particle population. Why is it a factor of five? Well, it's because the neutron has, uh, neutron plus this has five times as much energy as the alpha particle. That's why it's Q of five. Of course, ideally, what you really want to do is turn this off altogether. You don't want any external heating. Uh, it's, li it's like trying to light a fire in when it's pouring with rain and you're throwing carol. Eventually, I want to have enough fuel on the device so that it heats itself. Uh, that's ultimately uh, uh, an ignition regime or a full power plant. But even, even for Q of greater than 1, all you really need to produce a power plant is Q greater than 1, plus you need to account for all the energy that's being consumed by the experiment itself. So it's not just this factor, you have to consume for all the power that's being consumed by the magnets. This is a, a political slide, really, which just shows that, look, this thing's been making the progress as a function of time. If you compare it to the semiconductor industry, gee, it's, it's, it's making progress. Let's jump to the end game. What would a fusion power plant look like? Let's suppose I managed to get this to work. Well, at a top level, it's not going to look that different to an existing large-scale power plant in the sense that you've got a steam turbine generator uh, turning a turbine, generating electricity, which goes to, a, goes to a grid. The primary difference is the heat source. So rather than a coal-fired power plant or a fission reactor, you have a fusion core in which you have a thermal blanket around it. Uh, and you cool the plasma by a heat exchanger, which is driving this generator. So the neutrons are escaping the plasma because they don't see the field, they don't care about it, they go straight into the wall, they collide with the wall, um, and then you cool the wall by a heat exchanger. There's some other elements that are different. Uh, the elements that are different here are both the exhaust, um, extracting the helium ash, and also um, the primary fuel supply, um, those elements are different. This is a slide. I don't want to take away from this that fusion is competitive. All I want to say is that there is a reason to think that fusion might be competitive. Mm -hmm. And fusion is a research project. So extracting this to an economic conclusion is, is there, the error bars on this are almost as great or greater than the whole project itself. <coughs> the point is that there are modeling, there, there is economic modeling that has been done to suggest that fusion, at least in terms of internal costs, operating, constructing, fueling and disposing is comparable to tidal and internal and external costs is comparable to wind. I don't want you to take anything away from this solar PV because this slide is old. And when I gave this talk a number of years ago, Andy Baker's had a, had a got stuck into me and said, oh, that, that, that thing's wrong. That solar PV can't be anywhere near that large. It's much longer than that. He's right. So ignore the solar PV thing. I'm pointing it here really for comparative to, to tidal and comparison to It does generate radioactive waste, and the reason why is because the reaction itself doesn't generate radioactive waste. It generates a helium, which is stable, and an energetic neutron. But the energetic neutron is very energetic. So when it comes out, it smashes into the first wall. The problem is that it, will, it can mutate the first wall, and it can transmutate the first wall into something that is radioactive. But the, the time scale for that radioactivity is vastly different for that efficient power plant. So an efficient power plant, you're dealing with the fuel products themselves, the fuel byproducts that are radioactive, plus the facility. In the case of the fusion reactor, you're only dealing with the facility. And by that, I mean the first wall of the experiment <coughs> and the structure itself. But if you, look at, uh, if you look at analysis that looks at constructing it out of reduced activation fruitic steel and or vanadium alloys, and you look at years after shutdown, there are <coughs> modeling, there is modeling or calculations that is that within 100 years of shutdown, you can recycle the entire site uh, back to a greenfield site using existing technology. Using vanadium alloys, you could do it within 10 years. Using silicon carbide, you could do it within one. So the point is, this doesn't produce the same level of radioactive waste as fission, both in volume and also in time scale, and that's important. So let's go to talk about ITER in the next step. Either is this next step fusion experiment, the next step fusion experiment with a fusion power of 500 megawatts, power gain of 10, is core temperature approaching 100 million degrees centigrade. It's a growing consortium of a whole bunch of nations. There are now collaboration agreements with the IAEA, CERN, Principality of Monaco, and Australia. 
as of the 30th of September this year. So that's, that's true from Australian science. Australia did this by putting zero money into that, so far. Zero money. Now, for Australia to do that, that's, that's really a coup. Because the other members had to put of the order of a billion dollars into this. We did this for nothing. So why do we do it for nothing? Because we have expertise that can contribute. We need domestic support to be able to do the science, but there's no buy-in fee. And that's, that's unique. No, no one else has been able to do that so far. Curiously, Iran is interested in doing this. Why does Iran want to engage in fusion? It doesn't want to, it wants to pay to get into fusion. Um, but Iran wants entry. Now, you look at Iran, you scratch your head and say, well, maybe Iran wants to demonstrate atoms for peace as opposed to atoms for something else. Um, but that's a cynic. A cynic as a scientist. Um, if you look at the construction plus 10 year operation cost, it's now if you were 20 billion, who knows, it's likely to be double that. The, the reason is, is that this is a big scale fusion, this is a big scale science experiment. CERN went way over budget and way over time. There is no big scale science experiment that is going to go within, within scale. Um, if I look at this and say, well, 20 billion is a lot of money, who knows what the Joint Strike Fighter has cost so far? Who knows? 100 and 65 billion. One and a half trillion dollars. 1,500 billion dollars. For a plan that doesn't even work. <laughs> now, I'm being facetious. My point is that the plan maybe it does work. Maybe it's, maybe it's the next best thing since sliced bread. But this number is small by comparison to 1,500 billion, billion. That's the point that I want to take away from them. It's really tiny. The EDA objectives are to demonstrate the feasibility of fusion energy for peaceful purposes. As a physicist, what attracts me is all this grand challenge burning science. So the plasma is produced and dominated by this alpha particle self-heating. This is where we haven't been to before experimentally. We haven't accessed this regime before where the plasma has self-heating. That's what interests me as a scientist. All of this self-organization, non-Maxwellian and non-linear physics and these self-current driven regimes which are extremely non-linear. So there's lots of exciting science there that it, it attracts me as a scientist. There's also a very significant materials and technology issue. The technology issue is that I have to be able to demonstrate that I can integrate all these technologies together to produce a working power plant. And one aspect that hasn't been addressed really in enough depth until now is this materials issue. The reason why is because most of fusion has been focused on trying to access a plasma that will produce fusion power. If we get one, the question is, well, can we handle the, the, the wall loading? Because this neutron fluence is enormous. Not only is the neutron fluence enormous, but the, the, there's a diverting configuration that I'll show in a moment. There's part of the first wall that receives a, a massive heat flux. And being able to uh, develop a diverter that can withstand that very high heat flux is a real materials challenge, at least for a power plant. This is a, a, a catchphrase that a colleague of mine uses, perhaps to sell competitive grants. I don't know. Um, anyway, it's a nice catchphrase. So here's either in detail, as I said, this is about 500 megawatts. This is about 300 lightning bolts. This is about a third or a half of an Olympic swimming pool. Um, 73 megawatts, oh, I don't know how you convert that. If you look at your microwave, that's maybe a kilowatt at maximum. This toroidal field is 5.3 tesla on axis, so that's in the middle of the machine. So the field coil, it's 12 tesla. So the only way I can generate 12 tesla field is by making it superconducting. Superconducting using niobium and tin means it has to be at liquid helium temperatures. So a whole, a whole machine is in a cryostat sitting at liquid helium temperatures. So you're going from liquid helium to something with about 100 million degrees in the core. <laughs> this sounds like fantasy, but it's being built. As I said, it's hard, but it is being built, and various people have committed, or nations and alliances have committed to try to make this work. If I look at the fusion power amplification, um, present devices, Q is less than one, either is Q, greater than five in steady state, approaching Q of 30 for shorter duration. So that's sort of controlled ignition. Uh, the reason why I can't operate at Q greater than five for any length of time is really a cooling requirement. Uh, when you generate, uh, if you're generating too much heat, uh, the cryostat will exceed four Kelvin. And once the cryostat exceeds four Kelvin, you lose the superconducting properties of the magnetic field, so the magnetic field metrics. The temperature is about 10 to 20 keV, it's about 10 times the temperature of the sun. 
the energy confinement time is of order of a few, of a few seconds. This is largely set by turbulence and magnetic geometry. This is where much of the plasma physics comes in, this energy confinement task at time scaling. How long it takes this jug of water to cool down? And <coughs> lastly, the, the density, uh, which is determined by this ignition condition, it's around about 10 to the minus 6 atmospheric. So if you compare, if you combine that and that, you end up with a couple of atmospheres of pressure inside the machine. So it's not high pressure by atmospheric standards. It's only there were a couple of atmosphere, uh, but it's extremely hot. Ooh, you're with that. <laughs> I mentioned something about um, energy, much of the physics being in this energy and particle confinement time. If I look at this, this tau E parameter is really set by turbulence. And if you ask the question, well, why is turbulence difficult? Well, we don't even understand what turbulence is for a standard fluid, let alone a plasma, a hot fluid, a hot thermonuclear plasma. So it's been found, about 20 years ago, it was found that uh, it was possible to change states from what's called an L mode state to a high mode, literally low and high, uh, confinement mode transition. The primary difference between these two states was that one had a, a pedestal in the, in the edge pressure. So if I look at the low confinement state, its pressure profile continues from smoothly down to zero, whereas for the high confinement state, there was this pedestal, this cliff, in the pressure at the edge of the machine. And that cliff lifted the core uh, temperature inside the machine. And the point is, is that under this different magnetic field configuration, and it turned out that this confinement transition is associated with this magnetic exploit that I'll talk about in a second, that uh, you could get significantly better confinement. And this significantly better, better confinement really enabled the physics basis for ETA. So if I turn back to trying to understand turbulence, if a physicist doesn't understand something and they have a big box, what they do is they just play with all the box until something breaks. And then they try and understand how things change with that box. So what they did literally was that they had at confinement scaling, they varied the magnetic field, they varied the plasma current, they varied the heating power, the machine size, the elongation, the aspect ratio, and they played with all these knobs to try and see how the, the, the confinement times changed. And they fit it to some polynomial. Okay, that's very simple empirical physics. But without having a quantitative understanding of turbulence, that's about the best you can do. But interestingly, if you compare this confinement time scaling to the experimental measurements, they all fit. That's not particularly surprising because that's constrained to this data anyway. But the point is, <laughs> is they fit on this data and they fit over a wide range of parameters. And so this wide range of parameters gives us some confidence that this will extrapolate to ETA. A criticism uh, uh, physicists might make of this is that you're going still by almost an order of magnitude from the, this last data point to ETA. And that is a valid criticism, is that you are taking a big step. Okay. Well, it's a question of a combination of political driver of how quickly do you want this, as opposed to if you really want to go to the next step, maybe it's better to go a factor of two rather than a factor of ten. That's an open science today. <coughs> there's the cross section of the machine. The main point to make here really is that bigger is better. You can see the energy, you can see the major radius scaling with the confinement scaling, and there's a weak field strength, and there's a strong dependence with plasma current. The point then is, is that the design, if I want to build an even-class machine, it really has to be about this big. And the reason why is because, first of all, I need the stability consider I need to consider stability considerations. Uh, Q is this field pitch, so it's a measure of how quickly the field rotates in the toroidal per toroidal transit direction. And generally the observation is that this high Q is more stable. So the more the lower this ratio of Q is, so if the field is rotating watts toroidally per toroidal transit, it's known that the plasma can be unstable to an internal kink mode. So one tries to lift this plasma, this, this parameter, as large as possible inside this machine. You then need to factor in material limits, and this is where technology is dictating the scale of the machine, because this toroidal field coil, if it's a, if it's a, a liquid helium toroidal field coil, it needs a certain amount of shielding in order to be able to maintain it its operating temperature. If you have a high temperature superconductor, you might be able to reduce this level of shielding. Uh, but if you look at the material build, this sets the scale length and really the, the dimensions of the machine relative to the ionic coil, uh, the, the size of the toroidal field coil, and so on. 
If you fold all these things together, you end up with an EDA class machine. You end up with something which is 15 million amps, um, something which is about 3 meters, or yeah, well, 6 meters in major radius, and about 2 meters in minor radius. So the physics and the engineering is constraining you to something which is this big. You don't really have a choice. <coughs> unless you can get much better in terms of this energy confinement time scaling. Or unless you can change the field dependence. So if I make a superconducting magnet, magnet I could make an incremental, I could make not an incremental, a disproportionate improvement to the performance of the machine. There's lots of big challenge physics in terms of a plasma physics space. I talked about some of the things that attract me as a scientist, these new instabilities and burning plasma physics regimes. There are things called edge localised modes. So if I look at the edge of the field, uh, these are field footprints that are erupting through the last closed flux surface of the plasma. So this is a, an image of line emission from the edge of the plasma from adjacent images. And what you can see is this field line erupting from the edge. And this looks a bit, li little bit like a solar flare. It is, in some sense. It's a similar type of physics to a solar flare. <coughs> Sorry. And there's other physics, uh, particularly integrated modeling, which is trying to understand how all of this, the various different diagnostics and the various different mod models coupled to form an integrated model of the plasma, uh, particularly for control purposes, uh, that's important if you want to try and realize fusion power. I mentioned materials uh, challenges. Uh, ETA will have a beryllium first wall. So this is now looking at the first wall, this uh, shaded region over here. Uh, and this was chosen because it's essentially low atomic number. So why do I care whether it's a low atomic number? Let's suppose my plasma is primarily deuterium and tritium, and I have a wall. I can't make my wall out of deuterium and tritium because it's a gas. I need to make it out of solid. So I make it out of a very low atomic number material. Why? Because when I put a higher atomic number into the material, I will end up with a lot of uh, I will end up with a lot of line emission radiation and/or ionization. So what will happen is that the energy of the plasma will go into ionizing uh, the first wall. So if I make the first wall out of tungsten, a really high Z material, what will happen is that a lot of the energy will be dumped into the plasma just by ionizing tungsten. And tungsten also got a lot of atomic levels, so it will radiate like hell. So you'll end up with a large amount of um, heat lost, being lost through radiation. That said, <laughs> tungsten is used for the diverted target reason. And the reason why is because I talked about this X point earlier on. <coughs> so if I look at all the fields, uh, the fields inside this device, if I follow a field line inside this surface, the field will always lie interior to the plasma. If I go right to the edge, this field, the first field that erupts out of the plasma, comes along here and strikes this diverted target point. This diverted target and that diverted target there. And the point is, is that there's therefore the highest heat flux on the, on the material on the material surroundings is on this diverted target. And if I make this target a brilliant, it won't be able to withstand that very high heat flux. Tungsten can withstand it. The ideal choice is carbon, but carbon, uh, when it ablates, uh, can absorb tritium. And because tritium is radioactive and has a half-life of 12 and a half years, it has regulatory problems in terms of the French atomic regulator uh, using carbon for the first war because there's a radiological hazard associated with carbon. So the best that we can do for the moment is use uh, tungsten for this purpose. Uh, that creates problems because most machines don't operate with tungsten, they operate with carbon. So many of the existing machines, I talked about JET earlier, are reconfiguring their physics activity to look at tungsten walls because the physics changes, particularly the impurities change into the plasma when you put a tungsten wall in. The neutron damage uh, issue can be quite significant. So this is, these are existing machines, this ASDEX upgrade machine and JET. These are both European experiments. But if you look at the neutron fluence, they're tiny. They're basically zero. So this is the amount of damage that the, all the displacements per atom that every single wall are particle on the first wall will experience. If I go to something like ETA, that means that every atom on the first wall will be, di will be displaced by one neutron event over its lifetime. But if I go to a demonstration reactor, it becomes a huge amount of damage. It becomes 100 displacements per atom. So the wall has to be able to self and kneel. It needs to be able to heal itself. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to operate this reactor. This is a motivation for a separate uh, materials research facility. 
there are some unexpected big challenges in trying to put a machine like this together, <coughs> one of which is that 90% of the, of the components of it will be supplied by in-kind members from their domestic agencies. What that means is that some of the nations are responsible for oil field coils, but let's suppose there are 24 toroidal to oil field coils, I think it's 24. Only 18 of, 18 of them are being manufactured by these two nations, but they're not being made by the same manufacturer. So the point is, if I want to fit, try and fit something together, the ideal thing to do is you make it all by the same manufacturing firm, which is using the same mould and the same, the, the, same, the same lathe to create the machine. If I now do this across multiple different sites, I have a real risk the machine won't actually fit together. So that creates a real quality compliance issue. I, can't, I don't have $100 million to throw around like that. I have to make sure it works. At the, very, at, at the very first instance. So this is a real headache, trying to make sure that quality compliance is, is uh, insisted upon. And, and the caveat to this is this is not the optimal way to build an experiment. Uh, the experiment is a political uh, <laughs> uh, reality, <laughs> as well as a physical reality. It requires this level of uh, distribution of resources in order to make the machine uh, come together. There's other unexpected challenges, one of which is design, finalisation and cost. No physics experiment is built, it is fully uh, designed by the time it's approved. Uh, that's just life. Um, you see that in graph, you see that in everything too, really. Um, one thing that is perhaps more unique is that all of these, all of these nations and alliances have very different cultures and management approaches. And you would think, well, maybe that's not going to matter, but it does. So if you have a mentality of very Confucius top down, thou shalt do what I say, and I don't care whether uh, what you're saying is, is correct or not, you just have to do it, um, versus a, a Western system of, of challenging of the design, that creates all sorts of tensions. And th that, that is a real problem in terms of trying to go, uh, construct this machine, particularly when you have these very various different nations <coughs> doing this project together. There's a broad range of expectations. Some of these want this power delivered to the grid by within, within 10 years. Others, like the European Union, say, oh, well, look, we have a constant trickle of money. Uh, here's the constant trickle of money. I'm not going to increase it. I'm not going to decrease it. It'll take however long it takes. So they're very different mindsets. And then you can see why various politicians get upset. If you look at the most recent machine plan for this, the aim is to have first plasmas in 2026. And their first DT plasmas in 2035, that's a long time away. Uh, another way of saying this is that people entering the field now, they will be well placed to harness the machine in the prime of their career. <laughs> this is a multi-generational pro uh, project. This goes back right back to post-war period, it will go right ahead into the future, uh, assuming that the, the field is continuously invested in. Here's the, here's the site being built. Uh, this is taken from April this year. You can see this giant uh, assembly building under construction, the Tokamak pit. Interestingly, the site is several hundred kilometres inland. I scratch my head and ask why is it several hundred kilometres inland? Surely if you're building in a big machine like this, it makes more sense to put it on the coast. Perhaps where a big port would be available to move things around. But no, the French wanted an interior. So fine, so the French had to spend a lot of money in making, upgrading their roads to be able to handle large shipping containers to go from one end to the other. Well, that's their local headache, but it's kind of weird. The other thing that's kind of unusual is it's also an earthquake prone to a region. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's also sort of kind of weird because you think, well, maybe you choose a standard area. So the whole machine is now sitting on seismic isolators. Uh, look, it's fine, but it just adds to the cost. Sometimes you stretch your head and think, well, why did they do that? Anyway, um, anyway the machine is coming together. Um, there's lots of different things happening here. I had other slides to show here's the Tokamak pit. Looking up, a more recent photo, so the machine will fit, will fit there in the, in the core, there's looking down from the top. Interestingly, first plasmas have already happened. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a person standing, there was a person inside this machine at the time. But, oh, but they were in a Faraday cage, so they were fine. They got a big, they got a big, they got a big surprise. <laughs> That's where this lightning bolt hit it. Um, but they were fine, but it, it did make an interesting story. So that's, I've talked a bit about fusion power and introduced toroidal confinement. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Turner concepts and what Australia does now. 
So I've talked about the conventional tokamak, which is this large-scale you know, device. Another approach is to use a smaller aspect ratio, which is a bit more like a core apple as opposed to a donut. And the advantage of doing this is that because the field varies like one and a half, the smaller radius means that you have bigger field for the same pressure, higher performance, better stability, but there's less solar model current drive because there's less space in the center column. This is known as a class of spherical tokamak. There's another class of, of tokamaks that uh, address a problem associated with all tokamaks. And the problem associated with all tokamaks is that there's a large current inside the machine. Now, in itself, that's not a problem, providing that large scale current does exactly what I tell it to do. But plasmas don't behave like that normally. They, they want to relax, they want to go into a minimum energy state. So, what that means is that they're likely to try and disrupt. Um, and the consequence is that there is, because there's a large amount of stored energy in this field, and there's a large current in it, uh, this configuration can be prone to disruption. And that's why a lot of toroidal plasma physics, particularly tokamak physics, looks at trying to understand performance or uh, disruption avoidance strategies. The consequence of that is rather than try to, I mentioned before I had to put this twist in the field in order to avoid this grab, this uh, gravity drift and this electric, uh, this electric field, vertical electric field. In a stellarator, I can do that by deliberately twisting the whole machine or the field conductance. So in some sense, I transform a physics problem into an engineering problem, and that's exactly what I do. So it eliminates these disruptive current-driven instabilities, but it creates an extremely complicated coil. Or a machine like the Australian Heliac, uh, which uh, isn't able to trans... It, 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 doesn't, it can't possibly uh, uh, translate to a, a performance experiment because it's got this helical conducting the winding conductor very close to the core plasma. This other class of experiment, the Svendelstein 7X experiment, was a billion dollar experiment which was open this year by Chancellor Merkel. Um, I've been there, it's a very complicated experiment, <laughs> um, but nonetheless it, it is producing uh, plasmas and they are now being able to understand whether or not you can confine a plasma in a stellarated configuration uh, with good particle confinement. The last bit of the talk, I'll talk about my activity and some of the other things that Australia does. So my activity sort of embraces several different things. It embraces burning plasma physics and multiple fluid models, step pressure profile equilibria, which are trying to describe as fully asymmetric configurations, and this integrated physics modeling. So I mentioned before that when I put in this large supply of neutral beam heating, uh, what it does is heat the plasma. Because the field is not necessarily in the same direction as the beam, I can introduce anisotropy. So if I look at the, the gas in this room, uh, all the velocity is not, has no preferent, preferential direction, there's no flow in the room, it's isotropic. If I put this beam in and the beam is coming at an angle to the field, you can see I've introduced a preferred direction by having the field and the beam and they're all following. This can, this can mean that my pressure is no longer a tensor, no longer obeys the same properties along and perpendicular to the field lines. And this changes my MHD equilibrium equations by having a pressure that's now scale, uh, tensor as opposed to scalar, and I have a flow term because I've got this weight whopping momentum term being shoved into the plasma. This changes both the, 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 the magnetic field configuration, so this is this Q profile. The only thing to note is that the, the blue and the red denote pressures with, iso with anisotropy and with, iso with um, no anisotropy. And the point is that they're different. <coughs> and the other point is that they're, because they're different, it changes the flux surfaces, it changes the field configuration, it changes the wave modes that can exist inside the machine. This is a picture of um, wave band gaps as a function of S. It's a bit like Photonics, you can have photonic uh, uh, band gaps. This is exactly the same thing, except you have uh, toroidal alpha and eigenmode band gaps. The point is that the gap mode structure looks different. Another, if I turn now to fully three-dimensional configurations, so what I do now is I turn off flow and I let my pressure be scalar, but I relax the, uh, the, the assumption that the plasma is symmetric all the way around the machine, and I enable it to have three-dimensional structure. As soon as I do that, it means that the field isn't necessarily guaranteed to lie on a flux surface anymore. It can either lie in a flux surface, it could lie in a chaotic in a region, and the field could be chaotic in that region, so it can orgonically meander throughout that space, or it can enable, it can enable magnetic islands. 
So most physics approaches today throw that whole class of equilibrium away and say, I can't deal with it, it's all too hard. And so they just deal with this to flux surfaces. We have an approach, uh, which is this generalized relaxation principle, which we were fortunate enough to get an ASC grant from this year again, uh, which tries to understand how to construct uh, this model uh, using a well-defined mathematical formulation, and we're planning to move this on to talking about dynamical systems uh, for, rather than just static. The last activity that I work on um, is Bayesian inference, which is trying to integrate all these diagnostics that exist outside of the tokamak. In, in, it's really an inverse, or it's an, in, it's an inversion problem, a tonographic inversion problem, in the sense that I've got all these external measurements, and I want to work out what the interior magnetic field construction looks like. So if I take a CAT scan, it's a classic inversion problem. I have all these external measurements, and I want to reconstruct the image interior. This is exactly the same thing. I've got all these measurements exterior. I want to reconstruct the solution interior. And I do that normally at the moment with a force balance constraint for the model. This is a different way of doing it, using a Bayesian inference framework. It has various attractions, uh, attractive features about it. At the ANU, there's the Australian Plasma Fusion Research Facility, which uh, features this uh, medium-sized heliac um, with a field strength of 0.5 tesla. This is a machine that does toroidal magnetic confinement physics. It does it at relatively low temperature. You can explore basic toroidal magnetic confinement physics, but you can't go to high, high temperatures or high plasma confinement because the machine's not designed for that purpose. It's not possible to do an eta cast experiment in Australia for obvious reasons. Um, there's a plasma surface experiment, uh, Magpie, which is being uh, led by my colleague Paul McCord at ANU, which is looking at plasma surface interaction. Uh, and he has a, a more extensive surface interaction physics which is trying to understand the interaction of the plasma with the substrate target. The University of Wollongong has this uh, high temperature superconducting magnet activity and I said that there are a couple of things that might be able to be a game changer for fusion and, and the possibility of very high temperature superconductors is one of them uh, because that would significantly reduce the scale of the, of the experiment. ANSTO has an activity in ultra high temperature ceramics which is both common to fission and fusion uh, but it has recently stepped up this activity uh, in uh, fusion material space. And more broadly, so I've talked about a, a few of these things. The University of Sydney has a quasi-toroidal cathodic arc. Um, the University of Newcastle has high heat flux alloy activity. Um, Curtin has an atomic collision activity. And Macquarie University has some plasma spectroscopy and MHD and kinetic theory. It's very international, uh, strongly internationally engaged. Coming back to the Australian ETA Forum, this is something, this is something that I initiated with colleagues in 2005, and, and principally the purpose was to, we, I could see ETA was about to be formed. ETA hadn't been formed at that point, it hadn't been locked in, but I could see this was where the field was going. The field was going to be entirely dictated by ETA, and it is. Today, if I, I just came back from the Fusion Energy Conference, the whole field was about ETA, effectively. And the reason why is because this will define the field for the next generation, effectively. And so the purpose of this was to promote Australian involvement in, in, in ESA, promote the science of fusion energy, and advance uh, the recognition of fusion science. We generated a bunch of things. The most recent initiative was this strategic plan that was released in 2014. It had a bunch of different things, one of which was a program fellowship scheme supporting uh, this programmatic research engagement into fusion, this IPPA, funding for an Australian flagship contribution to ESA, a bunch of other things, and an MOU with ETA to formally enable Australian participation in ETA. That happened. At the end of September, there was an, an, an MOU, a collaboration agreement that was signed with Andy Patterson, head of, uh, of ANSTO, if you don't know him, uh, and Bernard Bigot, the ETA, ETA Director General. They signed a collaboration agreement, so there is now a mechanism for Australia to engage. This ITPA is a framework for internationally coordinated uh, fusion research. There's a bunch of different topical areas. The ones that I work on is mostly in the area of particle physics and our energy disruptions and control. But that's the programmatic arm of ETA. So if ETA wants to know physics questions or plasma physics answers, it turns to this body. And so my interest is engagement with that. My colleague John Howard is building, who has a, a contract for a coherence imaging diagnostic, which will look at flows in the diverter region, down in the target region. Um, you may have heard some publicity about that recently. Um, there are plans to build a higher power linear device um, at the ANU. So the question is, what's next? Well, uh, this ITP engagement and in interdiagnostic contract, um, we are hoping, will be funded at some level. 
there are wider, uh, there's a pathway to engage in all these other classes of current experiments. Um, fusion is one of those fields where there's a plethora, there's a large population of relatively high performance experiments, and accessing them is not a problem. The, the issue is more domestic support. So that's what's perhaps more important to us. Uh, there's also uh, a visit of the senior advisor to the EWG, Professor John Jacono, turning up in December for the AIP Congress. And I guess where I'll leave this is that I've introduced fusion power into water confinement. I've outlined the next step experiment, talked a bit about what the Australian Fusion R&D does, discussed some strategic planning for Australian engagement in ETA. And what I'd like to leave it with is I'm an optimist. I, some say you have to be to work in this field. Is what is the implication of when fusion power is realised? So on Earth, well, okay, it could produce essentially limitless fuel available everywhere, no greenhouse gases, it's intrinsically safe, doesn't produce long-lived radioactive waste, and is suitable for large-scale energy production. But if I turn beyond that, what could near limitless clean power do? Well, it could help lift the developing world out of coal. I once heard Tony Abbott say that coal could do the same thing. Well, yes it could, but it comes at a cost. If you screw up the planet, maybe he doesn't care about that. It could end energy wars. I heard him say the same thing about coal, but maybe that says something more about Tony Abbott. <laughs> it could power large-scale clean water through desalination. Okay, Australia has a problem with clean water access, particularly South Australia has a problem with this. So South Australia has a large-scale desalination plant. Something like this could power that. Maybe it might be able to remove some of the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere. Of course, it would be far better to not put it there in the first place, but it's already there. The atmosphere is already screwed. So one has to do something. Build more trees, what do we do? Mass genocide, collectively kill each other? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have to do something. Um, and maybe, look, I'm a bit of a tracking part. Maybe it might enable extra solar space travel. There's no way I'm going to be able to use solar power to go to another galaxy, or another, forget another galaxy, another solar system, another space system, because there's no light. So I'm not going to be able to do it. I need a nuclear power source to do it. So if you look at the probes that NASA sends to Pluto, they're all plutonium generators. Uh, if I want to send, if I want to do something on a much longer time scale, I need <coughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> Some time for questions. Um, well, I'm Stan Brogan from the School of Civil Environmental Engineering. Uh, a few years ago, with a couple of colleagues, Matt Dezendorf and Hayden Washington, we had a look at the issue of fusion, not the feasibility of ITER, but the implications of a um, what the Americans once called a mature fusion economy, but that's sort of disappeared from the literature. And unfortunately, most of these, this sort of the dream here, we, we had sort of half believed in, it doesn't add up, at least with the Tokamak system. Um, there's a whole range of problems that come up but to give an illustration, the, um, if you were talking about a mature economy of, say, oh, 10, 20, 10, 20, or 50 terawatts, or even bigger, because you're proposing here mass supply of water through um, this well, nation, that sort that, of thing. That's a very, I mean, that's, that's, that's... No, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is there's a, there's a larger environmental impact which the whole diffusion um, community does not seem to have touched on. And this is the sort of frustrating. A few of the people have, for example, they've looked at the amount of helium. There's just simply not enough helium to power it. So there's almost a need for different technologies or space. The machine doesn't which use helium. Like the, Sorry? Machine, the machine doesn't use helium. It uses. It uses. It okay. It, it doesn't burn helium. helium. It uses cryostat does. But it does use helium for cooling. Yeah, for the cryostat, it does. It's the quantities that have been um, have put in been put in. Um, come out of the models that have been done in Japan or China or wherever. If you start adding those numbers up, and there's a few European ones on this, beryllium is another example of a, a material which is in limited supply, tungsten. I'm not talking about here uh, one or two items or maybe a small fleet of maybe 50 or 100. I'm talking about a mature fusion economy where you have 
10 to 50,000 of these 3,000 megawatt um, generators because that's what it, you need to realise true fusion economy rather than just leave it to perhaps PV and wind to, to solve the issue. The question is, is it going to be a, a sideline technology or have you really added up the, the numbers to say, do these things actually add up in the end? So it's a fair, very fair question. The comment is that there are people who work in this type of space looking at fusion power modelling and yes, they try to take all of these factors into consideration. The thing I would say is that a fusion power plant will not look like ITER. I hope it doesn't look like ITER, because if it looks like ITER, it's not going to work. <coughs> it's just too complicated. But the point is, is that if you go back to, if you look at the conventional engine, for example, the car engine, you go back to the early days of manufacturing, you wouldn't believe that that's going to work. There are lots of examples in science where you do not think something is going to work based on your projection at the time. And science carries you in a, in a different direction. So the point is, this is a research challenge um, I'm hoping that throughout this pro, uh, pathway we can see that the physics, we think there's reasonable confidence that the physics will work. This is an experiment to demonstrate the physics works. It's an experiment to demonstrate technology integration. It is, it is certainly the case that I'm hoping that um, other technology develops in tandem that will translate that to a much cheaper power station to the grid and address these other issues. There are other issues associated with it, but that doesn't mean I don't think it should be invested in. The promise is just too large to leave it alone. And certainly if you look at it by, by context to the Joint Strike Fighter, whose sole purpose is to kill people, that's the point of its existence. And you ask, well, what's the balance of research investment? I'm not it's against, a no-brainer. I'm not against research at all. Yeah. It's more the... The problem I accept that point. Internal. Yeah, I accept that point. It is something that is thought about actively. And as I said, I'm, I'm so, I, I don't think ITER would, I don't think a power plant would look like ITER. I certainly hope. Because if it does, it's extremely expensive and very efficient way of generating power. That's alright. Hello. G'day. Hi. Um, thank you. It's obviously very, an enormous challenge and many things are, are, that need to be done are undone. Um, but it, I mean, by going on such a kind of brave quest, you expose yourself to luck, which is wonderful because there's positive luck as, as, yeah, well, there is. as well as there's risk. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of the sort of technologies that have worked incredibly well have really done so because of some incredibly lucky factor which yeah. played in to their development because things were better than we ever expected. That's true. Um, I, I make a parallel with nuclear fission technology mm. in that uranium dioxide turned out to be incredibly stable and very, very radiation tolerant. Mm. Um, and water turned out to be a fabulous coolant, mm. which also moderates neutrons and absorbs radiation too. Yeah. Um, these are the kind of things that you want to know if you haven't sort of started out down the path. That's true. Um, so I guess it's a tricky question because although you don't know them yet, I, I feel that you're kind of waiting for some incredibly lucky breakthrough that you haven't really found yet. Um, I don't think we're waiting. I think that is. I don't think. I don't think it. I don't think it's waiting as such. I think there is a lot of scope for development in the technology space um, to make the machine uh, less reliant on helium cooling, because that is, that is a real issue, I accept that. Um, uh, and also, you know, ideally, um, there are other machines, there are new classes of machines that are trying to explore what happens if you change the exploit configuration. I talked about this H-mode transition, low to, high, low, to high, low to high confinement. What you'd really want to do is go an order of magnitude again in, in confinement improvement, because the higher you make that confinement, the lower the, the cost is to produce that burning plasma environment. Uh, so there are experiments to look at what happens if you draw out the X point or split the X point into multiple pieces. The X point is what created that H confinement, that high confinement in the first place. Maybe if you draw out the diverter leg, so there's the super X diverter, the snowflake diverter, what happens if you splinter the X point into different directions. Um, that type of um, physics exploration might reveal something like a, an additional confinement transition, like a super H mode, 
that might enable the machine to be made at smaller scale. So I think the point is, is that this fairly confident expectation, reasonably confident, not 100%, it's a research experiment, that we might be able to realise that burning plasma environment. Is it going to be an economic machine? I have no idea. And that, that bears on this gentleman's question. That I don't know if it's going to be an economic machine. It, the, the, the promise is too good to let it go. I have one more question. Could you say something <coughs> about the um, Lockheed Martin approach? Oh yeah, Lockheed. Um, well, that, was, that was very intriguing. You know, just so that, that uh, caught us by a bit of a blindside because now Lockheed Martin was, I assume it still is, a reputable company um, prior to this event. Uh, Lockheed Martin, the people in it are very enthusiastic young people. That's great. Um, they saw a funding opportunity in the US to go after money, and they did. And somehow they managed to convince the Lockheed management, well, Lockheed Martin management, that they could go to press with this. And the problem was, was that they didn't have the science and evidence to back up their claim. And so it became immediately transparent, and Lockheed Martin looked like a fool for doing this. So they shouldn't have, their senior management should not have let this happen, simply because, I'm not saying the science is not worth investing in, what I am saying was that they could not substantiate the claim. They talked about a fusion power plant in a 747 or something like that. Power in a jumbo, Look, that's wonderful to think of. I'd love it to be the case, but there simply wasn't the evidence for it. They didn't have, they couldn't show, they couldn't show the temperature, they couldn't show the confinement, they couldn't show me the scientific evidence. I said, fine, show me the evidence and I'll believe you. And I'll stop working on this and I'll work on, on, on your confinement concept. But they couldn't show it. And so it became transparent that they were also seeking for an energy grant and look, they used an opportunity and it backfired. So that's where that and that's where that, they left that. I don't know what happened to that, that, that activity. Maybe Lockheed Martin continues it. I don't know. If they do, it's not in the visible eye. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Uh, two questions. I'll try and run through quickly. Um, environmental one. slash general advocate question. If fusion draws essentially hydrogen from water, smashes them together to make helium, which can essentially escape the atmosphere, can it basically drain the oceans? Well, the first thing to say is that the amount of, the amount of fusion, that's, the, the amount of product that's being consumed in this experiment is tiny. It's very high energy density. And the amount of helium that has been generated is very small. The amount of fuel that's in the machine at any one time is the order of a couple of kilos. And, and in terms of the total throughput, the amount of throughput is very small. Um, so I haven't done the modeling on this, but I would be astonished to think that that would create an impact on Earth's environment um, by comparison to coal, where I can clearly see uh, an impact. Um, so I would be astonished if that were the case, simply because the, the amount of fuel and the exhaust that we're talking about is tiny. Um, and when your comment about spitting water, well, okay, it's using isotopes, it's using deuterium, which is a heavy form of Hydrogen, ideally you just want to use deuterium, deuterium, deuterium which means you don't need this anymore. Um, that's long term. The deuterium deuterium reaction has a higher cross section, a lower cross section, meaning it requires higher energy steel. So that's why you go with the DT cycle first. It's the easiest one to initiate. The DD cycle is harder. So it is using, the DT cycle is using water and it's using um, tritium, which you buy formed by lithium activation. So it's not just water, it's also lithium. I'm just clarifying, because you asked the question about water, and I'm saying it was a lithium ingredient as well, at least in the DT experiment. Cool. Um, the other question was, um, hypothetically, if a student had just, or is very close to finishing a nuclear engineering master's degree at UNSW, with okay. Australia having a very nice seat table of this um, fusion process, what sort of opportunities would be available to people like that? Well, I guess it depends on what they're planning to do. So if they're finishing, um, and it depends on where they want to go. So if they want to go and work, um, like for a private company or something like that, or in the industry sector, um, the opportunities for that, at least uh, with an Australian passport, are probably going to be somewhat limited, simply because ETA is still, most of the manufacturing and construction is done by the ETA members. So Australia is not an ETA member, it accesses ETA science, but it's not an ETA member. 
So that means that they can't, unless they are, unless they are supported by a host nation, like France or something like that, else, they won't necessarily be able to work on the inside itself. That's just a, a legal requirement. Um, in terms of um, capacity to do research, there's tons of research opportunities uh, in that space, either within Australia or internationally linkage, in international linkages, uh, to do re uh, research in that space and become a scientist in that space. It depends on what you want to do. So if you want to become uh, a nuclear engineer, perhaps building, helping to build the, uh, the ITER site itself, I would say that um, the MOU, or the Collaborative Agreement, probably doesn't buy you much access to that, simply because the construction is owned by the ITER members in France. If you want to get engaged in science, so there is an opportunity. Um, so it depends on what your what your aim is. So, look, this is a very very interesting uh, talk. I know there's a lot of. Um, I'm, lot I'm of happy questions. to stay around. Yeah, um, Matthew will be staying around. There are some tea uh, and coffee. So um, let's thank him again, and um, you're welcome to stay around. <laughs>